Well, academic convocation is a venerable tradition at Wheaton College, as at many other colleges and universities. The faculty process in their well-earned and somewhat outlandish regalia. Uh, by the way, they are, if you don't know this yet, uh, according to Princeton Review, based on student surveys, one of the top 10 faculties in the nation. And so at Convocation, we gather to uh, celebrate the high purpose of higher education. We have a consecration through scripture and through prayer. And we ask a really important question. Why are we here? What is our purpose? Now, some would answer this question in a utilitarian way. They would be thinking primarily of what job you will do after college, hopefully a well-paying job. I think of the U.S. Secretary of Education, uh, former, who said, we are currently preparing students for jobs that don't yet exist using technologies that haven't been invented in order to solve problems that we don't even know are problems yet. So that's your future, I guess. <laughs> but for some of you, and, and maybe most of you, questions of purpose will run much deeper than what you do. They will go to the core of who you are. Sometimes you will wonder, why are you here at Wheaton? Maybe for some, why you are here at all. Asking this kind of question is part of growing up. I think it's always been part of the college experience. I was interested to read almost 150 years ago, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote about this in one of her novels. Um, it's written about the time that Wheaton was founded. Um, you may be familiar with her Uncle Tom's Cabin, which had an influence on the discussion leading up to the Civil War. But um, in addition to addressing the evils of slavery, Stowe wrote on a lot of other topics. And in one of her novels, she tells the story of a student who goes off to college full of high hopes and golden dreams. When I entered college, he said, I was sure that I was good for almost anything. Nothing seemed to me impossible. Riches, honor, fame. But he found that as he measured himself against other minds, and whirled around in the various experiences of college life, he grew smaller and smaller in his own esteem. And in lonely hours, his thoughts were full of self-accusation. What are you good for? For what purpose all the pains and money that have been thrown away on you? You'll never be anything. This is what he would say to himself. Well, like Stowe's protagonist, many college students wrestle with ultimate questions of calling, purpose, existence. And this is intensified by all of the trouble we see in the world around us. In a world with 60 million refugees who don't have a home to call their own, where acts of terrorism claim unsuspecting victims, as we saw in Barcelona last week, where neo-Nazis and anti-Semitists and white supremacists are marching on the streets of these United States, Charlottesville and other places, why are you here? Can you really afford the luxury of the liberal arts when there is so much kingdom work to be done in a world of injustice and where billions of people will die without Christ unless they hear and believe the gospel? One of the ways that we'll be working on these questions this year is by rediscovering the Reformation and rethinking its implications for the church in the 21st century. There are many good reasons for us to do this. As you probably know, 2017 marks the 500th anniversary of the Reformation in Europe. It was October 31, 1517, that Martin Luther made the post that went viral and changed the world. Uh, 95 theses pounded to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. Uh, one of the reasons I know this quincentennial is a major world event is because this little plastic Martin Luther has become the highest selling figurine in the history of Playmobil. Uh, Martin Luther, who would have thought? 
so it's an auspicious year uh, to, to think alongside the reformers in, in chapel and in other places. But there are other good reasons. The Reformation has really always been part of Wheaton's theological identity. In our statement of faith, we identify not only with the ancient creeds, but also with the theology of the reformers. And really, that's been true since Jonathan Blanchard. When Blanchard thought about what he was looking for in his faculty, he said, teachers ought to lead students both by prayer and instruction to infuse into the youth a zeal for reformation. And Blanchard wanted to send forth a host of young people, he said, at the sound of whose going the whole land shall tremble, students who were willing even to face martyrdom for the cause of Christ. And Blanchard's inspiration for that went in part back to Luther and the Reformers. He, he believed what they believed. The Bible is the only ultimate authority for the life of faith. We can only be saved by the grace of God, justified by faith alone in Jesus, by his work for us, not any work that we do for him. Also beautifully encapsulated in our year verse, one of Luther's favorite texts, on the power of the gospel and what it means to live unashamed for the gospel and to recognize that the righteous will live by faith. Jonathan Blanchard believed that this powerful gospel makes a practical difference in the world. His gospel-centered Reformation theology motivated him and his wife to open their home and their college to all people of all races from all countries for Christ and his kingdom. He wanted to see an immediate end to slavery in the United States, and at the same time to see missionaries go out and preach the gospel to all nations. And as we remember the Reformation this year, telling, I think, some forgotten stories about their commitment to evangelism and social justice, seeing how they used social media to spread the gospel, what they did for refugees and the poor. We will see that in looking back, Jonathan Blanchard was setting his college on a course for the future. The needs of our world are as great as ever. We need students who work for peace and justice in Chicago. So sad to read that just this last weekend, 60 people shot in the city of Chicago, nearly 10, 10 of them fatalities. We need the love and truth of Jesus across America in every place, every community where racism tears apart society. And all of this is why we need Christ-centered liberal arts education. It's why we're here. At least that's what the reformers would say because this is the kind of education they believed would make a difference in the world. I wonder if you knew that, that the reformers were champions for the liberal arts. Uh, some people tried to tell Martin Luther that really all that was needed was to teach people the scriptures, and Martin Luther said, no, we need the liberal arts. We need the learning of the ancient world, its language and literature. Luther said he regretted not reading more poetry at university and more history. He didn't want his own students to miss out. In fact, his desire, uh, he wrote in one place, was to produce as many poets and rhetoricians as possible. Let's hear it for English majors and communication majors. And Luther said he, he wanted students not only to learn languages and history, but also singing, instrumental music, the whole course of mathematics. It's, it's an expansive, yeah, mathematicians as well. Uh, it's an expansive vision for the life of the mind. And you read the same thing in John Calvin. As he, in fact, he wrote about the liberal arts in his big systematic theology, his famous Institutes of the Christian Religion. Calvin had studied at the University of Paris, one of the oldest universities in Europe, founded on distinctively Christ-centered principles. And he believed that studying the full range of the liberal arts will help us understand more deeply the secrets of divine wisdom. All of the arts emanate from him as divine inventions, Calvin said. These are the Lord's freely offered gifts to humanity. And given what the reformers said about the liberal arts, it's not surprising that the Reformation had a big influence on higher education. Uh, it's interesting to chart the numbers. At first, there was a dip in enrollments, 
because the reformers were very critical of the uh, theology that was taught in those days in some of the universities of Europe. But rather than abandoning those schools, Luther and his colleagues wanted a reformation of education. They wanted an influence in those schools, and they wanted to begin new ones. More students were going to college as the gospel began to have a growing influence, the numbers tripling during the 16th century. Most of them were between the ages of 15 and 30. It was a, a bigger spectrum of the age group than we see on our campus. Many were international students. They would travel from one country to another in search of the best education that they could find. During the Reformation and afterwards, Christians were not considered intellectually inferior the way sometimes they are today. Truly, they were on the cutting edge of global education. So I read about some of these colleges and universities. I found some of the same challenges that we face today. <coughs> Students worked hard. At uh, Calvin School in Geneva, 27 hours of lecture a week, science and math in the morning, classics and ancient rhetoric in the afternoon, plus Old Testament, New Testament, and theology. Exams typically were five hours long, but they did get a little vacation three weeks every year to help with the grape harvest. Those were the days. <laughs> uh, many students struggled to pay tuition, even though faculty members worked for modest wages. As a result of this and other challenges, fewer than half of incoming students made it all the way to graduation. The graduation rates were much lower than even than they are across our country today. But what they learned for as long as they were there made a difference. The scholars debate and will continue to debate, I'm sure, what effect the reformers have had on world history. Some of their influence was intentional. A lot of it wasn't. Much of their influence has been very positive, some less so. But most scholars agree that the Reformation touched every area of life, and it continues to have that kind of influence today, not just in the West, but around the world. China and Korea, Nigeria, Brazil, these are places where Reformation ideas are having an influence. And if we had the time this morning, we could talk about the way the Reformation influenced specific areas of life. I want to just gesture at that. We, we could look at economics. We could talk about the Protestant work ethic, the value of profit, uh, the rise of capitalism. The reformers were sharply critical of unjust business, especially unholy bankers. But they also believed that the, private, the proper use of private property was a blessing. <coughs> Silver and gold are not evil in themselves, Luther said. They are good creatures of God, which we can use both for the needs of our neighbor and for the glory of God. Reformation had a massive influence on music and the arts inside and outside the church. The reformers did not want to look at any visual images of Christ when they worshiped for fear that this would lead to idolatry, but it doesn't mean that they didn't love beauty. Now, Luther praised the beautiful art of music to be used in the service of our Creator and of his Christians. Calvin described painting and sculpture as among the pure gifts of God which the Lord has conferred for his glory and for our good. And then there's science. A belief in the order of creation and the truth of what God revealed out in the world as well as in the pages of his word, this, these ideas of the Reformation contributed to the rise of modern scientific investigation. Reformers had a lot to say about politics, about well-ordered government, about resisting tyranny, about freedom for people to choose their own leaders through a general vote. And hopefully your Professors will have time to say more this semester about the influence of the Reformation in their areas of expertise. I suppose you see that influence every day on our campus. But the way I want to end this morning is by giving you three simple Reformation exhortations that will help you make the most of your Wheaton education. First, be faithful to your calling as a student. Be faithful to your calling. Reformers believe that everything, every calling in life is sacred. There, there, there had been a way in the medieval world in which it had become common to believe that some kinds of work are more pleasing to God than others. Uh, people in ministry, obviously, this was the way of thinking. They're closer to God than people who work an ordinary job. Theologians are more blessed than lawyers and shopkeepers. This was the thinking. And we are still tempted to make some of those distinctions today. 
to think, for example, that going to Chicago for evangelism is more pleasing to God than working at Sam's. Reformers believed passionately that every kind of work and every form of ministry comes from God. It's part of his work in the world. And the implication of that is that every one of us has a sacred calling. Calvin said the same thing. We know that we were created for the express purpose of being employed in labor of various kinds. And no sacrifice is more pleasing to God than when each person applies diligently to his or her own calling. Uh, he also said, if you obey your calling, you are very precious in the sight of God. For you, right now, your sacrificial employment is to be a student. This is God's sovereign purpose. He's brought you here to learn. And so be faithful to that sacred calling. Give your amazing mind to academic pursuits. Do your best in your classes. Pray about your daily studies, not just your final exams. Uh, do extra reading. Go to evening lectures. Love the liberal arts like a reformer. Many students worry about what they'll do after college. Can I get an amen from our seniors? Um, we're here to help you figure that out. But in many ways, the best way to figure out your next calling in life is to be faithful to your present calling in life. Be faithful as a student. Second, be fearless in the pursuit of truth. Be fearless in the pursuit of truth. One of the reasons the reformers were champions for the liberal arts is because they believed that all truth is God's truth wherever it may be found. Now, when uh, people say that on this campus, usually they're quoting Arthur Holmes, who for many years was the chairman of our philosophy department. Turns out that Dr. Holmes was getting his idea from people like John Calvin. Calvin said this, all truth is from God and then emphasized his point by saying that even if wicked men have said anything true and just, we ought not to reject it, for it too has come from God. It's all part of believing in what a theologian would call common grace. Where has God revealed his truth? He's revealed it in his son supremely. He's revealed it in scripture as well. But the spirit also reveals his truth in creation, including through human beings made in the image of God. All of this is part of what God, a gift that God has for the common good of humanity. Here's one way that I like to think about it. God has not given his gifts only to Christians. He has given many of his gifts to everyone made in his image. And that means that we have something to learn from everyone. And if we don't, this is what Calvin said, we dishonor the Holy Spirit who is the source of those gifts and the fountain of all truth. And that explains why with discernment, we read many non-Christian authors on this campus as well as many Christian authors. They did the same thing at the Academy of Geneva back in Calvin's day. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of their regulations stated that faculty members shall make no attacks against the authors they are expounding, but take great pains to explain faithfully their meaning. There was a respect for the ideas of others. We should read ancient and secular authors with great admiration, Calvin said. Whenever we encounter anything true or admirable in their writings, we should recognize that even a fallen mind is clothed and ornamented with God's excellent gifts. This is the kind of thinking that lies behind the pursuit of truth, the fearless pursuit of truth. If all truth really is God's truth, wherever we find it, as long as we are truly seeking after him, there is nothing to fear from our studies. And so be faithful as a scholar, be fearless in the pursuit of truth. And third, be fervent in your worship of Jesus Christ. And when I say worship, I'm not just talking about what we do here in Edmond Chapel or uh, what you'll do in your local church. I'm talking about giving glory to God all the time, everywhere. This was the overarching motivation for the reformers. Indeed, it was one of their mottos, soli deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. God has made us. He has saved us. 
It's with the purpose so that he would be glorified in us and through us. To be very specific, Jesus gave his life for our sins. And this is the motivation for everything we do. We're, we're wanting to return the praise to him. When we speak the truth or care for the poor or give people the gospel or seek racial justice or play the timpani or set up a teammate to score a goal or run on the prairie path or decide whether we're going to do things our way or our roommate's way. All of these are opportunities to honor our Savior. And we should have the same goal in our studies. When you go to class or work in the lab or visit the library or go to the studio or sit at your desk or swing in your Eno or wherever you do your best academic work, make that place a sacred space. Set up an altar in your studies for the glory of God. Be like those scholars at Calvin's Academy who promised, I guess this was their version of the community covenant, that they would pursue their studies in all modesty and honesty to the honor of God. That's a good summary of the calling and motivation of a Christian student, in all modesty and honesty to the glory of God. Well, it seems appropriate to close with a quotation from the astronomer Johannes Kepler, who in 1605 gave the first scientific description of a total solar eclipse. So this is very topical. But it's also relevant to our theme this morning. As a child of the German Reformation, Kepler assumed that God wanted him to be a pastor in a Lutheran church. But a strange thing happened as he gave himself to his studies. He fell in love with science, and it led to a spiritual struggle. I wish to be a theologian, he said. For a long time, I was troubled. But now I see how God is also praised through my work in astronomy. Now, you may reach the opposite conclusion. Maybe you'll come in pre-med and go on to seminary. I don't know. The point is that Kepler made the most of his liberal arts education. He was faithful to his sacred calling as a student, as I hope you will be. He studied as hard in the sciences as he ever studied the scriptures. And in his studies, he saw that all truth is God's truth, all the way up to the starry heavens. And so he dedicated his life and his work to the praise of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. Will you please stand for prayer? Lord, we've been consecrated. We've been set apart. We've been prayed for. We recognize that every high calling is a difficult calling. And so whether we are students or faculty members or staff members, it's a challenge for us to be dedicated to that calling, to pursue it sacrificially, to do it truly for your honor and not for our own. And so we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, the spirit of all truth, the spirit of all grace upon this campus in Jesus' name and for the sake of his glory, amen.